presented by Phoenix Rising. Welcome to the Fixing Ruger 1022 Stovepipe video. Hi, Phoenix Rising here, and today we're going to be talking about an issue that some of you might be experiencing if you own one of these, a Ruger 1022. The issue we're talking about is failure to ejector stovepiping, and uh, we'll also be going over a little bit of fail to, failure to feed issues as well, okay? So if you're having this issue, uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot of good information for you on how to correct it. Uh, basically what we had is this is a stock 1022 works good with both standard and BX25 mags and here we have a, a, an older 1022 that was made in 1978 and was new to me in 83 and uh, literally thousands and thousands of rounds put through it uh, it was upgraded with an ER Shaw barrel and an Archangel stock and a Bushnell Circle X scope to uh, make it a lot more fun to plink with and play with and this rifle actually ran very well with both magazines, 10 round and the BX25s, but then it started having more issues with stove piping, primarily with your BX25 type mag. So I went on a mission to kind of figure that out and get it to run better. And what you're going to see is the results of all this. So uh, this video took a lot of time and effort to produce, literally a thousand rounds of ammunition or better, running through magazines, trying this, running through uh, magazines after trying something else, until I came up with two to three options that might help you if you have this situation. So uh, please like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned. we got some good stuff coming up here. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the process that I went through with this and the different segments and the different things that we tried. And uh, after this, there'll be an index so you can jump to whatever portion of the video suits you, uh, if anything interests you in particular. So to start off with, the basis of the test is we're using BX25 magazines and we're using cheap ammunition uh, Remington Golden Bullets, okay? And my thoughts on this were, I, I maybe CCI mini mags would have fed great and not had any issues. I don't think that would be the case, but they probably would have performed better. But a 1022 is like the ultimate plinking 22 rifle. So I want to use plinking ammunition, the cheap stuff that you're just going to go and pop a bunch of soda cans or something like that and have fun with and, uh, and save the more expensive ammunition for if you're doing something a little more uh, required that requires a little more precision. So uh, cheap ammunition, BX25 mags. Now this rifle did not have any issues and at all running a 10 round Ruger magazine. Those magazines are probably some of the best rimfire magazines out there as far as reliability goes. So 10 round factory mag works fine, just the BX25s are where I had stovepipe type of issues or failure to eject. Now, uh, the things that we tried that didn't work or I tried that didn't work, uh, I tried aftermarket uh, magazine retaining pin uh, plungers and springs. I replaced those with two different varieties. I'll show them in brief. Uh, I tried changing out the recoil spring. Uh, that didn't do any good. I tried cleaning and lubricating with different lubricants uh, inside the magazine. And what I will tell you, that didn't do any good, but I used some DuPont Teflon, spray Teflon lubricant, and that actually caused a lot of failure to feed issues. Uh, it didn't work like I intended. I had to take all my mags back apart and uh, and re-clean them and uh, dress them up and then uh, put some CLP on the bearing surfaces and stuff. So uh, I tried that. I did not try the uh, issue that some people have where they make a modified 22 shell and put it inside the mag. I didn't even bother with that. Uh, I did try dressing up the ejector which is actually a part of the magazine. It's not the piece that looks like an ejector on your trigger pack, okay? It's actually built right into the feed lips on your magazine, and that's very, a very important point, and why your BX25s give you problems. But we'll go over that. Uh, as a part of that, because these are cast feed lips, one thing I did do was I took the ejector 
and dressed it up so it had a sharper corner on it to maybe uh, maybe see if that would give a more positive engagement and feed issues. Uh, that may have helped more consistent ejection, but it didn't solve the problem. And then the two things that I did that had the most luck with mitigating the problem, and it didn't mitigate them all the way, but it did 80% or better uh, fix for it. First off is your extractor, okay? Uh, Ruger extractors are stamped steel, they're not the highest quality, and over time they will wear out. And what I did was first I took my existing extractor and I modified it. I dressed it up to a very sharp knife edge point and, uh, and then tempered it with a propane torch, heated it up till it was cherry red, quenched it. And basically that gave me a huge increase in performance and a much a much reduced level of failure to ejects. And I also put in a Volkortsen exact edge, I believe it's called an exact edge extractor, which again is laser cut and all that good stuff, and it's relatively cheap. But that had a huge impact on failure to eject. Uh, another thing that we did that had a huge impact was the BX25 magazine doesn't fit nearly as tightly in your factory stock or an aftermarket stock like this Archangel. So it has side to side play in it and I took the ejector side built up inside and to where the magazine was biased so that the ejector was closer to the center line of the bolt head and that had a huge impact on decreasing number of failure to ejects. So those are the two biggest fixes. Now at the end of the day was I able to successfully eliminate all failure to ejects or stovepipes? No, I was not. And there's a reason for that, and that is where inside of the receiver. So at the tail end of this video, uh, I'll be showing you the inside of my well-used receiver, comparing it to a, a much newer receiver with, say, less than 500 rounds through it. And I'll show you what to look for to be able to determine if receiver wear is part of the problem that you might be having. So uh, lots of segments, lots of good stuff coming up. Uh, this video, like I said, took months to produce, uh, tons of time and effort. So if you would, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. That's the fuel that keeps it going and allows me to continue to bring you positive content. So thanks for watching Index right now, and let's start digging into this gremlin. The issue, stovepipes in slow motion. The 1022 ejection process. Okay, uh, first, before we get into all of this stuff we're going to be going through, I want to put in a disclaimer. I'm not a gunsmith. I'm just a firearms enthusiast. Uh, I've been using my or exercising my Second Amendment rights for about 45 years now. So uh, I, I know just a little bit and I've seen enough stuff to hopefully be able to figure things out I would like to think. So let's go ahead and talk about the way this system functions on a Ruger 1022. Okay, first off, let me move this other stuff out of the way so we can get a good shot here. First off, contrary to popular belief, this little lever on your trigger pack that sticks up is not your ejector, okay? 
Uh, it is an ejector, but it's not the primary. It's actually a secondary ejector to eject the casing after you've removed the magazine out of the action, okay? So if you have a failure to eject, this item right here is not going to be your culprit, okay? Uh, if, it, if, it, if, it's, is your, if it is having to eject, then you have a whole other issue going on. Now, what is the ejector on a Ruger 1022 is on the feed lips to your magazine, and we'll get this up, and I'll be in certain pictures because I don't know how well this video is going to come out up close and personal here. But on your magazine, towards the back side, you have this small protrusion that comes out on your feed lip. This protrusion is your ejector. So literally, every time you put a different magazine in your 1022, you are actually changing the ejector, okay? Now, there it is on the rotary 10 round magazine. We'll go ahead and take a look at it on the uh, BX25 magazine. If I can get the logo to show here, there we go, Ruger, Ruger BX25. And there's the same portion of your feed lifts on your Ruger BX25. Now, uh, that being said, I'm gonna try and illustrate this, but if not, I'll throw in some pictures. Let's just use the 10 round magazine here. Uh, See if I can get this to where it's lit up good. Okay, so this would be approximately the position of your bolt in the closed position. You have your extractor on the uh, on your left over here, and that's gonna grab onto the rim of the casing, pull the casing out of the chamber, and as this slides back, and can we get this good? I don't know. You can see right there, your bolt's gonna slide back and that tab on your magazine is what's going to kick that shell casing out. And again, I'm gonna throw some pictures in here because this may not be showing up worth a darn on the video. So that's the way the system's designed to operate. So that being said, there are other things that we ought to talk about before we get into replacing parts on the firearm and things that can cause issues, okay? Uh, the biggest, issue that I could see that may impact you uh, is going to be your extractor, okay? And the reason for that is if this doesn't move freely, if it's binding up and you can see there is a good bit of travel in this, and again, I'm gonna insert pictures of the parts. If there's a lot of debris around this and this thing isn't pulling your shell casing out straight, uh, you might not get a good ejection process going and if you have a lot of crud and degree built up, especially because this, remember every time this feeds over a shell, this thing's opening up. So it gives the opportunity for crud and crap to get packed up under it and packed down behind your extractor. And that may well be part of your issue. Now you can disassemble this and it has a fairly long spring that comes back to about, to about uh, maybe here in the, uh, in the bolt uh, with a plunger that, uh, fits inside the spring, and then your extractor is just maintained into position by a notch cut out into going into the parent metal of your uh, bolt head. So uh, I would, before I would go and start changing parts, I'd actually take this thing fully apart, knock out your pin in the back, pull out and clean your firing pin in the channel. Just be careful when you do that because the spring kind of rests down in here and it's very easy to flatten the spring out or damage it when you take this out. Uh, but if you do have, if you don't have a free floating firing pin and maybe it's a little sticky or something, that could potentially impact it. Probably not, but it's not a bad idea to clean that out uh, every so often. But you do want to take out this extractor. And the way you're going to do that is to compress the spring back uh, your extractor can come out and then carefully release your spring. Good idea to sweep your kitchen floor if you're doing it at the table beforehand because this thing can uh, fly quite a distance if you lose control of it. So uh, that's some basic stuff to do before you even get into replacing any other parts because that really has a big bearing on a potential failure to eject. So that's how the system operates. Now, uh, what I'm going to do next is we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look at our magazines, okay? Because, I'm okay, so let's take a look at how these magazines interface with your receiver and your trigger pack uh, in, uh, outside of the being in a stock. 
Okay, so first we're gonna insert our standard 10 round rotary magazine. Let me flip it around the right way here. And here you can see the fit and finish of a standard 10 round rotary magazine. Now, if you'll notice, there's very little gap on the back side here. There's a slight taper to ease insertion of the magazine. Uh, you have a little bit of forward and aft play that's being, magazine's being pushed forward by your magazine retaining spring and very, very little side to side wobble in the magazine. And like I said, I've never had issues with the Ruger 10 round magazine. So let's drop that out and let's go ahead and insert our BX25. Now I do have the bolt out of the gun, which should not be an issue. I don't know if I can get this thing to cooperate with me. What am I doing wrong? There we go. It's uh, not used to holding it this way. Oops, had a pin fall out. And all these pins just basically sit in here. They're actually held in place by the receiver. So, okay, so now we have a BX25 magazine in here. And I'm trying to get this to where you can see it worth a darn. But you'll see we have a substantially larger gap and a, and a heavier taper in the front. And to hold it in place, we have this ridge of plastic across the back of the magazine, uh, which isn't as firm and doesn't give as great of a contact area as with the standard 10 round. Now, uh, going forward to backwards, we have about the same amount of play, but you can even see uh, the gap is, is much greater here. So it doesn't have as much support overall. It's basically just the two pins with less structural support from the shape of the top of the magazine. Now, what I want to show you, and this is where I think the real issue is, is okay, there's a forward to back wobble. Very little, not much more, not that significant of an amount more than with the 10 round magazine. Now the side to side, on the other hand, is substantial, okay? Uh, I think that not having the extra mass and this tight of a fit all the way around allows us to swing to the, from side to side. And it also has a lot more mass that's going to make it more predisposed to moving. Okay, so let's go ahead and illustrate this a little better. So I'm going to roll this on its side. I'm going to try and stabilize this uh, receiver. If I can get it to where... Now that is close to a quarter inch of movement at the end of the magazine. And I think that's where really most of your failure to eject issues with the BX25 are going to come into play. Because remember, you're basically, you have a slight support surface in the back here on this uh, plastic ridge, but you're hanging your magazine between two pins and any angular side to side like this, if this magazine shifts to the left, what's going to happen is it's going to take your extractor and roll it farther out from the bolt head to where it may or may not catch or may barely catch the casing. And if it's not catching the flat back of the casing and instead is catching the rounded portion of the rim, that's going to dramatically impact the way that casing travels as it tries to exit the action. Okay, so I think that's probably your biggest culprit here. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to change out the springs. I've got several springs and we'll take a look at those. Uh, so let me pause this and we're going to pull the trigger pack out and show disassembly of that and how your plunger and your magazine retaining spring and all that actually fit in here. 1022 magazine plunger and springs. Okay, we're not going to show disassembly. We're just going to talk about the differences between the normal and aftermarket parts and then test them. Changing these parts in the case of this rifle did not make a difference in fixing failure to ejects. All of the springs appeared to have the same wire diameter with the tandem cross and extra strength kid springs being slightly longer. The kid plunger has a more rounded profile on the magazine end and the conical taper that pushes the magazine is slightly longer. I did find that magazine insertion was slightly more difficult when using the kid plunger and stronger spring.
biasing the magazine using foil tape or other materials. While at the range, we decided to attempt to mitigate side-to-side -side magazine wobble using foil tape. The way we did this was to keep layering foil tape below the magazine latch plunger on the ejection port side of the stock to help keep the ejector better engaged with the bolt. Once we had eliminated most of the wobble without impacting the ability to insert magazines, we tested the results. The foil thickness we ended up with was approximately 0.03 inches. The proper amount needed will vary by the individual rifle stock combination. Once the thickness needed is determined, I would recommend using a wood or epoxy putty and filing sanding to the correct thickness for a permanent fix. It's important when doing this to keep the material towards the bottom of the magazine well in order to have the desired effect. Here are the results. So what we did was we went ahead and you can see the foil tape on the side of the receiver. We built up the ejection port side of the receiver to help the magazine stop its side to side play and keep it tensioned to where your ejector on the magazine is better engaged uh, with the bolt. So uh, let's go ahead and do a mag dump and see how she works. And there you go. Understanding extractor wear and operation. Okay, uh, we're back. Uh, to recap, we've changed mag plunger springs, magazine plungers. We've added tape to the inside of the uh, receiver, and that actually worked out to be about three one hundredths of an inch uh, that deflected the magazine enough, and that did solve the issue, but I don't believe that. Uh, you know, I, I use these mags without any issues previously, so that shouldn't be something you have to do. But it will work if that, you know, if you don't have the parts, then that might be a temporary fix to get you to uh, have more reliability on your rifle. So let's talk about the last piece of the puzzle here, our extractors. Now, I'll be inserting a lot of photographs because I know this isn't going to show up so well. But what we have here, we have our original bolt for the uh, rifle that has an issue. We have another Ruger 1022 bolt for a rifle that uses BX25 magazines with no issues. So I took a lot of pictures. I really examined this. There is some geometry, geometry differences between the new extractor and the old one. Uh, or Yeah, new and old. Uh, there are a few geometry differences. This extractor has a little bit more of a back cut going in, going up as it goes back from the leading edge of the extractor, whereas this one's a little bit more straight. But these are both factory Ruger uh, e extractors. So let's talk about the process, and uh, and then I'll t as we do, I'll talk about what I found. So your ejection process. First off, your extractor doesn't come into play during normal firing until, until you hit, get to the ejection. Because remember, you've got pressure driving this casing back, and that's what's actually moving your bolt backwards, okay? It's, so, so this isn't grabbing the casing and pulling it out of the rifle unless you're ejecting or extracting a, a live round or a dud or, you know, if you have a fail to extract, then... Of course, you're gonna this is you're gonna try again to, to have this extract your round. So this is gonna latch on your case relatively firmly, and then as the rifle bolt moves backwards, your ejector on the magazine is gonna come along and gauge the rim of your case right here and pop it off. Okay. 
only it's not going to pop it off. This is happening fast with a tremendous amount of force. So it's going to unlatch and the, the amount of force that that extractor or ejector can impart onto the casing is going to be determined by when that casing releases off of your extractor. Okay, so uh, when, I, when I did all the uh, looking at this and photographing, I actually took the extractors out and I'll insert some pictures here, but I didn't really see anything that keyed me so much as to there being a huge difference. La yeah, a little bit of wear maybe, but it just really didn't look that different to the naked eye or in pictures. A little bit, but not, uh, not enough to where you really would key onto anything. But what I did find was I took the extractors when they were out and pulled them across my finger uh, to, to see if I could feel how, how, how it felt, how, if I could feel the, the individual grooves on my fingerprint. And what I found was with the new extractor, or newer extractor, that I could very definitively feel the grooves from my fingerprint. When I did the same thing with the old extractor, I could feel the grooves, but they weren't as pronounced. Uh, and that's a very, very subtle difference, okay? Uh, going back to everything's back assembled, let's take a look. Here's our original bolt. We'll put a casing in here, and what, what happens is, like I said, it's going to roll and kick this out, and I'm going to just kind of pull and see how this feels. And this kind of slides off of here fairly easy, okay? Let's do the same thing with this new newer extractor. And you know, as I'm doing this, it it's kind of I can't really show it in video, but as I'm doing this, this thing's biting into the case. As I'm putting a little bit of tension on it and pulling, I can feel that this thing's actually this leading edge of this extractor is biting into the rim of the case and holding it much better than the original extractor and again this this is a factory extractor in this bolt and it's had thousands of rounds through it okay so uh, that's what we have that's a condition we have right now uh, I have a Volkwurzen extractor coming and uh, we're going to put that in we're going to take a look I'll take some photographs and we'll come back and take a look at that get it installed in this bolt and see what the difference is then go to the range and put it to the test Ten twenty two extractor repair. While waiting for the new extractor I ordered to ship, I decided to see if I could repair the old one to like new function. So I dressed the extractor using a jeweler's file, then tempered it using a propane torch. Okay, so we've got our extractor in our vise, not uh, very stable here, but uh. Let's go ahead and just, and again, this is just a jeweler's, a flat jeweler's file. What I'm going to do is just try and, without moving much metal, try and dress this to get a little better. A little sharper edge. Oops, moving this in focus, out of focus here. And this may not be, uh, oops, okay. What I'm looking for is to just sharpen this edge where it's going to bite into the rim. better. And I really want to, don't want to move, remove much on the inner surface, more from the top that's going to glide over the uh, rim. But I do want to true this up. That's looking pretty darn sharp to me. See if we can 
get that in focus and we'll see about getting a little closer look now this feels very very sharp I can feel the ridges very cleanly on my let's get this out of the way here there we go it just had to catch the focus I'm sorry about that delay there so now as we roll this around can see that uh, hopefully you can see and I'll take some pictures to insert here too that we have a very very razor sharp edge and to me it looks like uh, it looks still pretty flat and I might actually try and I might actually whoops if I can get this stint back in focus I may actually try and back cut this just a little bit just to make sure it's gonna bite good but uh, that looks a lot better so let me go ahead and just see if I can back cut this a bit. I probably should put it in a vise, but uh, and that's another thing. There we go. That's maybe that's just a tad better. But that's another thing too is when you look at the depth of your notch on this extractor, this thing's going to be sitting off. It's not going to fully the outer rim of the case is not going to be touching this back surface if I can show you this okay but the outer rim of the case is not going to be touching I got a pointer sitting right here and I'm not using it the outer edge is uh, the back the outer rim of the case is not going to be touching this back surface it's only going to be really resting on the tip and a little ways in on the notch so Okay, I'm looking at this. I cannot see any reflection from the edge and boy it feels sharp So what we'll do is we'll put this in the vise. We'll, we'll heat this up a little bit and then uh, sp Spray it down with some WD-40 or something to cool it back off <coughs> And hopefully that'll add hardness to this edge uh, Temper it a little bit then we're going to put it back in the gun. So let's go ahead and do that Okay, so we're back. We've got our, as you can see, our part in the vise. I did try tempering it and it looks like I might have been somewhat successful. Uh, but I never got the part glowing cherry red, which is what I was shooting for. And then I was going to quench it with uh, a little bit of light oil, break free. Uh, so we're going to try this again. I just put it in the vise a little differently to where I have less metal to metal contact. Because I think we were just pulling the heat out of it as fast as we could put it in. So we're going to give this another shot. So let's go ahead and start uh, start this process. Move my coffee cup out of the way. I'm kind of fond of my coffee cup. So. And this isn't a very big piece of metal, so I would like to think that it's possible to uh, temper it. So let's go ahead and set so much light on this thing that. And I'm not going to be able to light to see, so let me turn out these lights and get to it here. Okay. So let's just see if we can throw enough heat onto this to uh, get it to the temperature we desire. There we go. I think I may have had it uh, too, too close in. Now that's what I'm looking for. I, apparently it's me, not the uh, anything else. That's good enough? I think so. Go ahead and... Okay. Let's try.
turn on some lights and take a look. So there we have the part. You can see it's uh, darkened significantly all the way down to the where we had it clamped at. And I think that I think the way I was holding it was part of the problem. And I also think because I had it clamped up here, all the heat was just being pulled into the vise. Where when I went to the narrowest portion, that also helped me to be able to uh, get this uh, heated up the way I wanted to. So there we have it. Now we have a redressed and a tempered extractor for a Ruger 1022. And I'll take a couple pictures of this close up so we can see the results. Uh, we'll go ahead and put this back in the bolt. Then uh, when we get our other part, we'll go to the range. We'll see if this fixed the problem first. And then we'll put the uh, replacement extractor in it. Because that might be, a if, it, if this works, then uh, hey, you may not even have to spend $14 if you're willing to uh, if you're willing to take a little time and you've got, you know. Final testing using replaced extractors and guide rod recoil springs. Okay, we're going to do one last magazine for a total of five. No stove pipes. I would say that's a pretty successful end result. We had one dud uh, that fired on the with just with cycling the bolt, and we have one stove pipe on the last round of the first magazine. So 125 rounds, one stove pipe, one dud that wasn't a feed issue. Uh, I'd say that is a pretty successful fix. Okay, bonus mag. We're going to do one more mag, magazine number six, because my camera, when I turned it on with my phone, somehow it went to manual focus, so I don't know if everything's going to be a blurry mess or not. So let's do one more mag. This should be in focus this time for sure. So one more mag. Oh, and we just had one stove pipe and I think that might be close to the last round up to nope hmm now that is interesting two stove pipes now that's the last round so isn't that interesting we went uh, we went four magazines with one stovepipe. Camera may have been out of focus. Last magazine, would we have two stovepipes, two or three, at the tail end of the mag? And that may well be a magazine issue because we had four other mags that really functioned pretty dang good. So, uh, gee, everything's always mucky, right? But by far, much more reliable than it was. Perfect. No, and that may be a mag issue. I haven't taken a, this. I'm, let me see here. This is this a new one? Uh, this one looks like I've had it maybe for a little while. Uh, might just need cleaning because I have, you know, I've been using these and not cleaning them. Uh, and I wanted to come out here with magazines that maybe were a little grungy. I had a, a rifle that was a little grungy because that's the way you, things are normally going to be. It's not going to be pristine every time you shoot. And if it only works when it's pristine, that's a reliability issue. So anyway, uh, mag number five, we had a couple stove pipes uh, at the tail end. And uh, let's go ahead and switch out our extractors and see what we have next. Okay, we're back. Our rifles had a chance to fully cool down. We've replaced our modified original extractor with a Volkwartzen extractor and extractor spring. They come as a kit usually. So we've got those installed, fresh magazine. Let's see how all well this functions. Oh. Okay, one stovepipe. 
and that was the last round again. I wonder if that was the same magazine that did the last round. Magazine 4 with the Volportsen. Again, last round. One more short. Okay, five magazines with our modified extractor, five with our Volkortsen and new extractor spring. Uh, as you can see, heck of a lot better results than what we had previously. Uh, keep in mind, this is one gun. This is just an issue that we had with one gun, and we've kind of worked through. Uh, also, keep in mind. The rifle's dirty. We haven't cleaned it since we started. We used some old, some new magazines that haven't been cleaned and lubricated in a while. And we're using cheap ammunition, uh, Remington Golden Bullet 36 grain hollow points. So these, this is, you know, we're doing this under kind of real world plinking, uh, that sort of an environment. Uh, which if it functions well there, when it's all clean and spanky new and you've got uh, higher end ammunition, it should work even better. So. Uh, there's a couple other points I do want to bring up, but we'll do that on a tabletop here coming up next. Uh, and, I, and, and we'll talk about why too, but I think there's a way to make this even more reliable than what we just experienced here. So let's get to the tabletop and close this video out. Okay, so we're back, and this is going to be, I think, pretty much the final round. I've got the extractor in, and I have replaced the uh, recoil spring with another factory Ruger recoil spring, because like I said, this gun was manufactured in 1978, seen a lot of use. So we're going to go ahead and run through some OEM mags, or I mean, I'm sorry, some of the polished mags, and lastly an OEM, and see how this thing works. No issues. Nope, oh, have something going on here. That was a failure to feed. And another failure to feed. failure to feeds at the very first, other than that ran smooth. One stove pipe. Two stove pipes. Slip, pardon me. Okay, OEM mag. One stove pipe. And out. Okay, now we have one more thing that I'm going to do, two bonus mags, now these are the modified magazines where I took the ejector 
and squared it off so that it had a little, wasn't didn't have that rounded very corner. So if it hits it at all, it should get a little better, a little better bite. So let's see how these function. No malfunctions. One stove pipe. And out. So it appears the modified magazines might just help a little bit. Well, there you have it. Uh, I've replaced about everything you could replace. I've tinkered with the magazines. We've done mag springs. We've done extractors. Uh, dressed the ejectors on a couple mags, added some foil to wiggle side to side, and uh, in the end I think we have a big improvement from the starting point, but I don't know if there is a 100% fix, at least using cheap ammunition. We might just uh, come back and shoot 100 rounds of CCI Blazer or something and see if we happen to uh, have any malfunctions there. Receiver wear and how to check for it. Okay, last segment of this video uh, is going to, going to be going over the, re the receiver, which you can't do anything about aside from take care of your receiver to prevent wear and tear on it. But I wanted to go over this because this is a contributing factor. And I've basically, as we've gone through this video and I've tested and vetted all these different parts and solutions, uh, the one constant has been the receiver, okay? So uh, I wanted to go over this, and again, you know, extractor, uh, a good extractor or, or redoing your own extractor if you feel savvy about that will get you a lot of headway and failure to ejector uh, stovepipes and, uh, you know, helping to bias the position of your BX25 mags in your mag well that can really assist you in solving this problem. But one thing that I, I never was able to totally get rid of the stovepipe issue, I got it to where it was minimal on the older receiver, but I could never get rid of it, and here's why. I have right here two receivers. The newer one that probably has less than 500 rounds to it. It's new to me, but not new. And my old 10, venerable 1022 that's probably had 20,000 plus rounds through it that I've had for, shoot, uh, 35 years. <laughs> yeah, gosh, showing my age here. Uh, but here's what's going on, and this is something I just want you to know so you can check for it and understand that this is a contributing factor. So here we have our standard 1022 bolt with the uh, recoil spring sitting in its recess on the top. You'll notice we have a large cutout for the spring, but the spring is biased to one side, okay? On the other side, we have one small notched cutout in the bolt, and that cutout is maybe about 3 30 seconds or one eighth of an inch deep going down into the top of the bolt. <coughs> but really, this is the working part of the bolt that goes with this lip inside of your receiver right here that runs along about a quarter of an inch in from the side of the receiver, that is the working friction surface that holds your bolt centered from left to right, okay? Now, uh, so this is a little bit of what's going on. First off, because our spring is pushing from one side in the back and locked up front, it's going to bias this bolt towards the ejection side, okay? So when you're in the rifle, looking at it upside down, this spring force wants to push your bolt outwards, okay? So you're going to have, there's, there's, not, there's not a corresponding mating surface on the, on, on the inboard side. Why? Because this all biases it towards the outside. There's no shelf, if we can get it to show up here, down here on the, on the uh, non-ejection side, just on the ejection side. So this is a wear surface and a surface that needs lubricated and kept clean in operation, okay? So... All that being said, let's go ahead and drop our bolt in to 
our receiver and push it up a little ways to about where your ejection uh, is going to be taking place. If I can hold the rifle and do all this. So I got I have the bolt pushed up here and I'm going to take and wiggle that side to side now. And if we can get this in focus. You might not be able to see that, but you can should be able to hear it on the audio. Just a little bit of wiggle. Is it a lot of play? No. Maybe five thousandths, maybe ten thousandths, uh, if that. But there is play there, okay? Now, let's take this new receiver, put the exact same bolt in it, and do the exact same test. Bolt's in about the same position. Nothing. Yeah, it has to have a little bit of play, but not enough to wiggle, not enough to make any noise, and that is a big difference because because this surface that this is riding on, and I'll show it in the older one because you can see it, this one's still all spanky new, so uh, the surface that this bolt's riding on over time has worn down uh, due to, again, very long periods of use, 30 plus years of use in the case of this particular rifle, to where you have slop in it. And that slop, because it's pushing away from the, uh, towards the ejection port side of the receiver, is going to actually push it away from your, if I get this down in here, sorry, if, it's going to push it away from your ejector, and, uh, and is going to be a contributing factor in uh, failure to eject. And if you'll remember, uh, this rifle runs fine with your standard 10 round mags and the reason for that is these fit very snugly to where they don't have any wobble in them and uh, because of that even with that little bit of extra play in the receiver uh, you still get good connection on your uh, shell casing from your ejector on a 10 round magazine that doesn't exist because of the looseness of fit on your 25s. So uh, something else to check for just to see if that might be something that's uh, contributing to your uh, to your issue and unfortunately the only way you're going to mitigate that is to get another receiver uh, which is the registered part of the firearm. That's a serialized part no different than a lower is on an AR-15. So, uh, so there you have it. Okay. Uh, and again, this rifle's seen extensive use, you can tell, very well worn. But this can happen on a gun that's uh, uh, newer, especially if you don't, you know, I, I, keep, I tend to keep these lubricated very, very well, uh, probably even a, maybe a little bit over lubricated. Uh, and I don't mind cleaning, it makes them easy, easier to clean, and I clean my rifle fairly often. But if, if you're shooting this thing and... Uh, and you're running very, very minimal lube, and you're getting a lot of debris and crud in here without lubrication, keep in mind that your bolt basically goes almost all the way back right to about here in operation. So all this is getting impacted and crudded up with lead and powder residue and everything else since 22s are recall operated and dirty. So again, clean and lubricate well, and that uh, should give you a lifetime of service out of one and uh, something else to check for if you do experience stovepipes and the like. So uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, please like, share, and subscribe. This video, believe it or not, has taken me several months of going back and forth to the range, buying and adding and modifying parts back to the range again, shooting a lot of video that you're not actually seeing. And uh, just again, this has probably been one of the most uh, difficult videos I've done to date. But uh, I hope you got benefit out of it. So again, just like, share, and subscribe. And uh, until next time. I hope you enjoyed this video on fixing Ruger 1022 stovepipe issues. If so, please like, share, and subscribe. This video took a lot of time and effort to produce, and while free to download for personal or educational use, please link and give credit. Commercial use of this video is expressly forbidden without my consent. Thanks for watching.